this is Doug McConnell. Um, I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the co-founders of A Long Swim, uh, the um, uh, the the uh, nonprofit that was really formed as a way to raise money for collaborative ALS research using uh, open water and marathon distance swimming. Um, it's um, a, a perhaps kind of a novel connection, but it's, um, it, it, it's ended up working out um, quite well. Um, <clears throat> we have a, a wonderful uh, webinar for you this evening uh, to, to really focus on the research that has been supported by uh, A-Long Swim and, and um, and others, um, I, we, we have a couple of our researchers here with us this evening that we really want to um, uh, kind of highlight. But just to take a step back for a second, this whole endeavor started uh, 10 or 11 years ago uh, when we had the idea of, um, of uh, marrying up the, the, the niche sport of open water swimming with a kind of a niche disease of ALS. Um, ALS is a, is a disease that has hit my family quite hard. I lost my father to ALS in 2006, and, um, and, and we were particularly floored that same year when, um, when my sister Ellen was, uh, was also diagnosed. Um, it, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a disease where there are currently no survivors, um, and it, the, the news of that uh, diagnosis just hits you like a ton of bricks. And it was Ellen and I who then just decided we had to do something. We needed to make ourselves feel a little bit less powerless in this whole process. And um, so I had the idea of trying to do something with swimming. She had the idea of borrowing the, the acronym of ALS and calling it A Long Swim. Um, originally, we had thought that um, uh, you know maybe we could make it across the English Channel and raise $50,000. Uh, she was um, uh, she was quite emphatic about the fact that uh, fifty thousand dollars was a ridiculous goal, um, and yet um, uh, uh, since then we've raised thirty times that amount. Um, it's been an interesting interesting process, but it couldn't have been done without a target for that um, uh, the, the, that that research funding, and that really is the Osdenler Lab at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine. Um, somewhere along early on, we, we had the opportunity to meet Hande Osdenler and um, were just gobsmacked by her enthusiasm and really were inspired by so many of the, of the projects that she was working on at the time, many of which that were not popular in the, in the, in the uh, sphere of ALS research at the time, uh, but with, with really inspiring determination and a complete dedication to collaboration and teamwork, not only within the university, uh, but um, uh, with ALS research centers around the world, we really feel like um, uh, we found the right, um, uh, the right laboratory to, to um, uh, support. And it was, and, and, and each year we would have a conversation with Hande and we would say, okay, is there a little project we can kind of get behind something that needs a little bit of money to see if it has some promise to make um, uh, to be appealing to, to other uh, donors and, and so forth. And we often would pick almost in a venture capital style model. And <clears throat> each year the, uh, we would pick something um, and uh, with, with Hyundai's guidance and, um, and sometimes they didn't work out so well and other times uh, they were spectacular. And, and, and a couple of those projects will be the subject of some of Hyundai's remarks here in, in a few minutes. Um, at, at one point along the way, <clears throat> excuse me, three or four years ago, um, we had that same conversation and Hande told us what she really needed was another postdoc in the, in the lab. Uh, rather than support a specific project, it was uh, what she needed was a, was a person and kind of had her eye on someone. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let my nephew, um, uh, Brenton Blakeman, tell a little bit about the story of how the um, uh, the next steps that we took. Brenton, are you there? Yes, I am. Thanks, Doug. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brenton Blakeman. Um, I'm Ellen's uh, youngest son, uh, so that would make Doug my uncle. Um, so yeah, um, as Doug said, we we started the process year by year of always going to Honda and saying, well, what what project should we fund this year? And about three years ago, she came to us and said, you know. What I really need is, you know, more physical help. I need, you know, bodies to help me pursue these projects. 
So we hatched the idea of funding a fellowship instead of a specific project that we chose out with Hyundai's guidance. Um, so that came to be um, the, and my mom would have absolutely hated this, uh, the Ellen McConnell Blakeman ALS Research Fellowship, which is uh, more than a mouthful. Um, however, um, who you will soon meet, um, Dr. Mukesh uh, Gautam, um, affectionately shortened that title to the Ellen Fellow, which we all uh, appreciated uh, not having to um, spit out that long title, but it was a uh, a much more fitting, simple name um, that I think uh, we all latched on to. Um, so Mukesh is on the call with us this evening. Um, we were honored to have him be our uh, first Ellen Fellow, and uh, especially with the success that he had uh, under the title, but also his enthusiasm. Um, and um, we will meet him in a little bit, but now I'm going to hand it off to uh, uh, the head of the lab that we support, Dr. Uh, Hande Osnler. Um, and um, who I'm sure you've uh, all met and you know we can't say enough great things about. So over to you, Hande. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Doc, for organizing again uh, this webinar and thank you, uh, Brandon, uh, for your remarks. And you're right. I think uh, Mukesh was the uh, best choice to be the Ellen Fellow. And, and I think the idea of um, supporting ALS research uh, comes or boils down to uh, collaborations and teamwork. And when it is, the goal is um, initiating new collaborations or working together, you really need people who have uh, been trained in a multidisciplinary fashion. And they are, you know, they don't look just with, with, an, with one angle, but have multiple angles and uh, are willing to take the risk, do the projects, and work with others. I think these people are the ones who are going to uh, be the uh, game changers. And in our lab, as you know, we um, work with numerous uh, people, not only at Northwestern, but also in United States, in Europe, all around the world. And I think that's how the science uh, will move forward. So when Mukesh actually um, joined the lab, I'm going to tell the story if you don't mind, Mukesh. Um, it all started with an email and it says, you know, <laughs> Dr. Handers Dinar, I would like to uh, join your lab. And he was actually writing from India. He just completed his PhD. He got an award and he, uh, his, uh, he received fellowships to come to a Gordon conference. He received the award for his master's. And it was obvious that, you know, he trained in this field, that field, and he was bright and smart and enthusiastic. And I said, okay, you know, why don't you give a, a job talk or, you know, give us a presentation? So he, if, at the time we didn't really have Zoom, you know, we actually had <laughs> personal invitations, but for Mukesh, we actually connected uh, via, the, via the internet because he was in India coming from all the way to India to give a talk that would be, too much to ask for, for him. So uh, he gave a talk at our lab meeting and it's our rule that everyone in the lab must approve the newcomer, okay? So I can't give a decision by myself. And Mukesh was unanimously accepted. Everyone accepted him with uh, enthusiasm. And si till, you know, since that day, uh, he has been a, a great collaborator not only to members of our lab, but I think he will explain to uh, many other people. And, and I'm very thankful to you, Doug, and you know, to you, Brandon, as well. I think this is how we should move science forward, by uh, supporting the initial phases of collaborative research, because there are so many scientists out there who have very brilliant ideas, okay? But if there, we don't support those brilliant ideas and we let them slip by, then we are not innovative because the first step of innovation is that little spark, right? And that little spark needs to be uh, supported by some maybe small funds, but that small fund is the investment which actually will have a huge turn, uh, turn, turnaround. And I think that's what uh, Mukesh has accomplished in our lab and I'm very happy to be working with him and I'm happy that he's uh, with us tonight. 
Hande, before you go on, and Mukesh, before you say a few words, I also forgot to tell everyone, if you have questions, and we are going to have a few minutes for questions and answers at the very end, um, you'll notice on the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a Q&A button uh, that Kate is kind of monitoring and so forth. I was supposed to say that at the beginning, and I failed to. So as you have questions for Mukesh and certainly for Hande, <clears throat> on, uh, with respect to some of the um, uh, projects that they're working on, please use the Q&A box and we will make sure we answer your questions. Anyway, Hande, I beg your pardon for interrupting. Go ahead. Oh, no, oh, no problem, no problem. So um, with this, maybe I should introduce uh, Mukesh Gautam to you and uh, I would like him to tell a little bit about his story, you know, uh, his undergrad training and uh, how he um, found our lab and most importantly, um, with the fellowship that he has received now, uh, what collaborations was he able to initiate and what new information he was able to generate. So Mukesh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Hande. And thank you, Doug and Brenton and the entire team of Along Swim. I am very proud, very honored, humbled to be the inaugural um, Ellen Fellow. And the, it feels very happy that I will always be the first fellow, you know, there can never be any other fellow. I will always be remembered or I will always have the, the honor to be the first Ellen Fellow. And I'm very, very grateful for this. I am, um, it's a great pride and privilege for me. Um, I come from India and I grew up in rural India. And when I say rural India, that is very different than rural whatever rural definition you have here. Um, and the, the one example I can give is that um, in late eighties um, until I completed my elementary school, in our place, we did not have electricity. And so <laughs> that was the rural idea. <laughs> uh, so, but I was very curious um, even from the beginning, especially science enticed me so much earlier also, whatever little resources or the, we were taught at the school. Science always, always uh, interested me. And so I went on to do my undergrad in, in um, uh, zoology and the plant sciences and chemistry. And, you know, it, give, it gave me more understanding of, you know, the, the life per se, how the chemistry binds it together, how the plants and animal lives are intertwined. And then I, I did my master's in life sciences with uh, an, a specialization in biotechnology. And that was the real, you know, a time where I was really, really interested into lab research and science per se. So I, I went to do my master's thesis in a, in a very reputed big lab, research lab. And that's where I, for the very first time, you know, case the, the, the research, uh, the, the laboratory experimental research. And I enjoyed so much. And for my, my master's, I, I was awarded the gold medal because I taught the class. Um, but it, it was very interesting for me that I was able to do experiments, research by, my, by myself. And um, I liked it so much that I went to do went on to do my PhD in the same lab where I did my master's thesis. And for my PhD, I studied how, how hormones and the controls the, the body and the, the endocrinology and the physiology behind it. And after you know doing completing my PhD, I was looking at the avenues to venture into the other field of research. Because by then I had had a good understanding of how a system functions, and because in the in the endocrinology, all the hormones and everything, they originate in the brain, and that's where they control. So I was inclined to do uh, how you know brain is involved in the other functions, and while doing that research, that what could be more interesting, I came to know uh, about the neurodegenerative diseases. And that's where I, when I, so when it was time for me to transition into a, a postdoc position, I was looking for labs specifically working on the 
neurodegenerative diseases. And then I happened to visit Dr. Alzheimer's lab webpage. And, and honestly speaking, I never heard of ALS before in my life. The, the day before I visited that lab webpage, I never heard of ALS. And then I, I read about a little bit about it, and then I got interested. And then I, I emailed her about you know, my interest into the position, if she has any open position, and if uh, I could join the lab. Then we had several email exchanges, and then um, you know she sent me some papers to read, uh, like more specific about the uh, research, and that's how it started. And I, I was really interested, and then we got a midnight Zoom interview or Skype interview. <laughs> it was midnight in India afternoon here, and that's how I came into the the lab, and I have been in this lab ever since. Yes, thank you so much, Mukesh. Thank you. So, uh, but while you are in the lab, I think also thanks to the fellowship that you have from a long swim, uh, you not only had just one project, you had multiple projects, right? You initiated numerous projects, worked with many people, you've done uh, many collaborations. So can you tell us a, lot, a little bit about, you know, how this fellowship helped you, what collaborations you started? Would you tell us a little a story about the uh, research endeavors that you have taken? Of Maybe course. You share your slides, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, when I joined the lab and because I was new to the field for initial, like, you know, a year or so, I understood, I, I tried to understand and, you know, um, uh, study more, research more about the brain and the, the, the ALS and the other thing. And I have, I had my primary project I was working on, but the fellowship really, really helped me venture into the different dimensions of ALS. Um, it, because the, with the fellowship, I, and, and as, as Doug said earlier, that this fellowship the, is, more into you know uh, developing bridges and making collaborations with with other scientists around, not only at the Northwestern but in the other institutions, and the fellowship really helped me you know explore all those possibilities, because I was not not um, constrained by you know whatever the project I was working on, and then I have to do that with the fellowship. It gave me that freedom that I could reach out to people who are doing different kind of or different expertise, which we could use in our research to answer some questions which other people are not answering. And that really helped me reach out to three, four, five, and I'll show you more in when I talk more about my research in detail, that it 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 helped me develop those collaborations and and understand about the, the ALS from the perspective of the other people who are not doing ALS research. And that I think was, and it, it is a, 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 you know, a, a kind of area where if we have to bring you know, novel uh, technologies, novel therapeutic approaches, um, to answer the questions in ALS, that 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 is what we need now, and th that that freedom came by this uh, uh, fellowship I got from the uh, long uh, long swim. And so, if you allow me, I can share some of my or highlight of my research, and that might further uh, tell in detail how it worked for me. Yeah. And Give me one second, please. So this is where it all started, this iconic picture I like so much, so much. And uh, I, I actually, right before this, I was in India visiting my family, and that's where Hande emailed me saying, you know, there is this thing coming up, coming up, and it's a, it, it's like a welcome for you when you come back. 
So I, I, I came back you know, in the early January and that's where the, the fellowship announcement came through. So this project I started working on and the, the first collaboration we developed was with Dr. Marco Martina and Dr. Gabriela. And they are here at the Northwestern in the Department of Physiology and uh, Dr. Martina is an expert in electrophysiology and electron microscopy. Um, so we, we set out to, to investigate what happens to the upper motor neuron, which are diseased due to the loss of health and function. Before that, several people, four or five groups around the world, they had developed mouse models to recapture what happens to the disease. In, in the Elsin function loss, but none of the mouse models that they generated, they showed any uh, uh, you know, behavior phenotype or the, the disease pathology. And that was an intriguing question that although the Elsin function is gone, but the mouse is not showing pathology. And that's where we thought about it, that the, the mouse may not be recapitulating the disease pathology of the patients because the mouse brain and the, the human brain, they are different. There is species difference in there. But a mouse neuron is similar to the, the human neuron. And if we focus our attention more on to the cellular level or the neuron specific, rather than looking at this species level, we might have had some answers. And that's where this collaboration really helped us. I spent time learning this powerful technique called immunoelectron microscopy. And what, so before I go into this, this, this is another very powerful tool that our lab has generated and to study upper motor neurons. And it is, uh, we developed this reporter mouse model where upper motor neurons are green. And that allows us not only to visualize this neuron in the sea of you know, many million neurons in brain, but also allows us to study individual neuron in great detail. And I developed immunoelectron microscopy. And what we found was that although these neurons to the rest of the world look fine in else in mouse models, but they indeed were very sick when we look deep into this individual neuron by electron microscopy. And while a healthy neuron had very healthy mitochondria, the mitochondria in this uh, in upper motor neuron on LC mouse were very sick and they had massive defects. And the other neurons which were not upper motor neuron, which were not CSMN in the same mouse, they were also not sick. So that gave, that gave us this incredible information that the, although the mouse is not, does not look sick, but the neurons are really sick. And that information we could use further uh, to, to understand what goes on. Because in, in Elsin mutations, the patients are really young. The, the, the youngest patient is like you know, 10 to 12 years old. And it, it's such a devastating thing to have a, a ALS kid patient in home. And, and we did not have a, a understanding what's going on, but this allowed us to at least venture into, see what, what should our direction can be where we can um, investigate more. And to take this further, um, we collaborated with Dr. Eileen Biggio here at Northwestern, and we set out to investigate what happens to the upper motor neurons again in TDP43 pathology. Now, the important thing here is that TDP pathology is detected in 97% of the ALS patient, patients, be, be it familial or the sporadic, regardless of how the disease was onset was there originated, they had TDP pathology. And that makes it very interesting area of research because it, that's a, like a bridging factor, a common factor between different kinds of one. And you know, there are talks would say there are different kinds of ALS underlying causes. 
but GDP 43 kinds of binds all of them. And so regardless of what, what there's the uh, differences at the species level, if we can find a common pathways at the cellular level, then that information can be translational. And with this study, uh, we showed that, and you can see here that the, the upper motor neurons in, in control or in the normal human being looks okay. Their mitochondria look healthy, okay, but not of the ALS patient. Interestingly, we see exactly the same thing in the mouse models as well, where in the wild type, they, the upper motor neuron look good, their mitochondria look good, but not when they are diseased with ALS. And you can see how, how similar the, the pathology is at the cellular level, which otherwise we can miss if we just look at the, the mouse models and the patient. The, the other pathology where we see the, the different kinds of cells which are activated upon disease, they also look very same in the, in the mouse as well as in the patient. And so, while we were doing all these studies and perfecting our art of you know, improving or understanding CS, the upper motor neuron, Dr. Silverman, he developed a, a compound, a chemical compound that, that um, reduced the, the toxic protein, protein in the cell. But Dr. Silverman had done all those assays in a dish and they have seen that it indeed reduces toxic protein you know, in the cells. And so, we collaborated with Dr. Silverman and we, we treated the mouse with the compound that he developed. And um, as many of you already know that that compound is NU9 and it, it, it shows that the, the compound treatment, the NU9 treatment really helps these, excuse me, really helps these upper motor neuron regain their health in terms of their healthy mitochondria, in terms of their more intact uh, endoplasmic reticulum. And so this, this collaboration is very fruitful in terms of whatever expertise we had, we, we were able to use those to, to really come up with the, the essays or the, the outcome measures that we could use to see if a drug is working or not. And so we have seen that these problems or this mitochondrial defects are there. But one very important question we asked was that how early these defects, defects occur? Because whatever we've been, or the other people have actually done, um, investigating and we did also was when the disease is already set in. But most important is to know if those defects occur early, much earlier than we actually see the disease pathology or the phenotypes. And so to answer this question, we, again, uh, use different, different uh, neurons which were diseased because of different underlying causes. And then we use the, the powerful technique of immunoelectron microscopy. And what we found was very interesting that these neurons were just 15 days old they, while they, the mouse lives 150 days or more or 120 to 150 days. These neurons were just 15 days from a 15 days old mouse. And those babies are still with their moms with no sign of disease in sight. But when you look deep into an individual neuron this way, you could, you could still see there are mitochondrial defects going on already. And these defects are very different than what we've already seen in which the mitochondria kind of elongates and it just um, um, encircles itself and it finally dies. As you can see in these different progressive stages of mitochondrial degeneration. And there was no like a, a, a word for these uh, these kind of phenomena in, in in scientific literature, so we coined a new term and we called it. Uh, so we coined a term and we called it mitoautophagy. And interestingly, not, not all the different underlying causes 
gave rise to same mitochondrial defect. So, for example, where the, the mutation was in a SOD1 gene, the, these mitochondria just swell up. They were defective, but the, the important thing here is that to see the mitochondrial defects. And when we know the problem, then we can look for answers, how we can help it. So the, the next obvious thing came to our mind was, we have seen all these mitochondrial problems, but what actually these problems lead to? Because mitochondria are central to energy production and to basically run the whole machinery, you know, to life, to the neurons and to the body itself. And so in, in ALS, if we see that the motor cortex, there are in the upper motor neurons, there are these messy mitochondrial problems. How these problems lead to different metabolite disturbances. And um, Dr. Navdeep Chandel here at the Department of Medicine at Northwestern, uh, he extensively works on mitochondria and he's an expert in mitochondrial um, diseases and the mitochondrial physiology. We collaborated with him and what we did for this project is that we take out a chunk of motor cortex from TDB43 mouse and isolate the metabolites and sequence them and to know what metabolites are dysregulated. And we have seen that there are a, a significant difference in the metabolites which are important for the energy production and for the oxidative stress. And this again, this is an ongoing project. We haven't finished it, I'm still working on it. But th this gives us a, a lead that I already know by my research and that mitochondrial problems are a central like a theme where in the different mutations or different underlying causes in ALS, mitochondria get affected. And with this current project, we for sure know that mitochondrial problem leads to these metabolite differences or dysregulations. So the next thing we could do now is to identify what metabolites are dysregulated or what other compounds we can find out, which we can help to either restore the balance uh, of the metabolites or we can help the mitochondrial health that in turn can help energy production and lowering the oxidative stress. And that's kind of is very interesting here because in neurodegenerative diseases, people have seen mitochondrial dysfunctions but haven't actually come up with anything so far. And in, in our research, because you know, we get confused when say, oh, there are so many different kinds of ALS and different kinds of um, underlying causes. But our research highlights that those under underlying causes converge at the mitochondrial dysfunctions. And if there is a way or we can find ways to fix those problems, that, that gives us a hope to come up with some kind of therapy soon in, in, in near future. And it looks very tangible to me that not very far from now, we can develop some therapies that can help the mitochondrial problems and help with the uh, disease. Yeah, but Mukesh, maybe we shouldn't say mitochondria is the only converging path, right? So it is one of the key converging paths, but if I we say you, yes. all ALS converge to mitochondria, I think we would be wrong. So my, mitochondria is definitely important, but it cannot be the only converging target, right? I, yes, I agree with you, yes. But, yeah. I, I, Mukesh, on that, on that uh, subject specifically, a very good question has come in uh, with respect, and I'll just read the question from Wendy. Um, is there a possibility that the mitochondrial uh, cell changes can be used for differential diagnoses uh, along with paths for treatment? Does, the, um, does this lead you to individual pathways for uh, differentiation of, uh, of treatment of a patient? Uh, 
Hello? Oh, um, yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, did that make sense, Mukesh? Yes, absolutely, yes, that's a very good question. Um, but the, it, it certainly can be used as a biomarker in that scientific terms, if I may say so. Um, that mitochondrial problems or you know mitochondrial dysfunction can be detected, but to to detect in a patient because it's like a system wide thing, uh, and what we have seen is very specific in in uh, uh, neurons very early. I I don't know of any as of now, but but I am confident that it can be developed into into diagnosis stick markers for, uh, because for mitochondria, what people use uh, standard S's for now are for like, you know, the uh, reactive oxygen species generation or the ATP, et cetera. But those defects, because they are very pronounced prominent defect, they come very late in the disease. And by the time we, we significantly detect them, it's already late. So we have to come up with assays that are more sensitive and more uh, accurate, and those can that can detect slight, very small changes, and that that certainly can be used. Yes, yeah, definitely. So if I if I may add, uh, Mukesh, so if we can find out which patient has mitochondrial defects and use that information as a way to classify patients and identify the subpopulation of ALS uh, you know, group of patients who would benefit from treatments that would actually focus on um, mitochondria is very valuable. And I think numerous labs are working on this and uh, detection of uh, mitochondrial proteins in the blood, in the serum or plasma or even CSF are uh, ways to do it. And uh, those are ongoing studies as well. One, one other comment I would make and for the benefit of our guests tonight, um, you know, and through Mukesh's remarks, as well as Hande's, obviously there is a real recurring theme here of upper motor neuron study. Um, and that's been a real hallmark of the Ozenler lab since its beginning, I believe. Um, and and it, at a time when uh, the study of upper motor neurons was uh, was really considered, um, uh, you know, sort of less uh, exciting, maybe less viable than um, uh, than some other uh, areas of ALS research. In those ten or twelve years since then, I would also say that it uh, the study of upper motor neurons has become one of the main tracks of um, of the study of this disease. So not only was Hande and her crew. Um, uh, so instrumental in pioneering that study, uh, it's really become one of the main uh, the main tracks. Um, Hande and and Mukesh, talk for a minute about the connection or the uh, the overlap, if you will, um, with some of these upper motor neuron studies that you're doing right down to the mitochondria that could um, uh, could have a benefit or a re a, a, a re a relation to other motor or, um, uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Parkinson's was specifically mentioned, but um, but talk about its um, the the overlap there. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Doug. Yes. So there is a question actually. What is there a connection between ALS and Parkinson's from uh, Sally Ackley? And uh, to be honest with you, previously uh, the drugs or I'm sorry, the uh, the diseases were characterized by clinical uh, evaluation, right? And at the time, we did not know about genes and we did not know about the underlying causes and we didn't have the knowledge that we had today. But as we understand the underlying causes, the mechanism and what happens inside the neuron, why they become sick, why they are vulnerable, the more we understand, the more we realize that these are all interconnected that there is an ongoing neuronal stress and that they share very common or some uh, very common biology. Um, and these are also shared between ALS and Parkinson's patients. For example, mitochondrial dysfunction is also observed in Parkinson's patients uh, uh, in also in a subpopulation of ALS patients. And yes, there are uh, recurring uh, themes 
among different uh, patient groups. So I think in the future, there will be a drug and that drug will not be for one disease, but that drug will be for a mechanism. And whichever patient shares that mechanism or develops a disease due to that mechanism, they will be prescribed to that drug. So the drugs will not be an ALS drug, Parkinson drug, Alzheimer drug, but the drugs will be, for example, drugs that overcome mitochondrial dysfunction, drugs that overcome axonal transport defect, drugs that overcome uh, cortical hyperexcitation, drugs that overcome this. So then wh whichever patient develops a disease due to that cause uh, will be able to have access to those drugs. So our goal is to do the matchmaking, to understand why the patients develop the disease, understand the underlying cause, and align the drugs that are either uh, FDA approved currently with known mechanism or new drugs with novel mechanisms and do the matchmaking. So then it's not, it's not gonna be that there is no drug for ALS or there's no drug for Parkinson, but we will actually go more towards personalized medicine approaches that we will have to find the best drug or best drug combination uh, for each patient. And I think this is our quest and we are in the new millennia and this is something that we should be doing. And I'm very proud of uh, Mukesh's work because it laid the foundation, it realized, let's look down into the neuron and ask the neuron, what's wrong with you? Like, why are you so upset? And then the neuron reveals itself, right? It says, oh my God, my mitochondria is breaking apart. Oh my God, my Golgi, my ER, my site architecture. So it, you just see it. So when you just see why neurons uh, fall apart, then you know what their problem is. And of course, therapies come after that. And, and, and what a revolution in uh, not only diagnostics, but drug delivery and so forth would that be? How exciting is that? It is very um, exciting. <laughs> These are very exciting times. And I think we yeah. generated uh, information and knowledge uh, within the past, not our lab, like in general, uh, all researchers around the world, the extent of knowledge that we have generated within the last 10 years, maybe even more than what cumulatively has been generated uh, over the 50, 60 years. So especially with the omics, like with uh, RNA-seq, uh, proteomics, lipidomics, metabolomics, and using pure populations, not just the whole mesh of the whole brain, but like pure population of neurons, the amount of data that we generate is remarkable. And that uh, gives us very precise information of why neurons become diseased. Once we understand why they are diseased, then you can build therapies. But beforehand, we didn't really know exactly uh, what the problems were. And we assume they're all the same or they are uh, in ALS, it's just one problem. ALS is just one disease. But now we realize uh, it is actually an umbrella. It is actually combination of multiple things. Right. Well, um, the, I, I know that um, we had kind of wanted to take 45 minutes for this. And um, uh, I, I just wanted to thank uh, Mukesh, particularly Hande also. Thank you so much for um, uh, enlightening us and really inspiring us as we, as we go forward. I think another, another um, you know, sort of page from the current events is obviously the last 20 months or so um, we have, um, uh, we've, we've managed through this COVID process. And one of the things that we've learned is, um, you know, big challenges require big money. Um, and, um, uh, and, and we will, this is why we swim. This is why we raise money. This is why we, um, uh, we're, we're really passionate about the mission of, um, of a long swim. Uh, there's there's another another question that came up, um, uh, Mukesh, uh, and, and I know some people have to leave and and thank you if you have to pull off. I, I completely understand. A couple of other questions, Mukesh, have come up specifically with the um, uh, the number of mitochondria in in uh, upper motor neurons uh, that have been afflicted with ALS. Do you want to talk just for a minute about the um, um, about the um, um, uh, the, those numbers? Um, yeah, so in very, one of the preliminary study, studies that I have been doing, we have seen, seen in, 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 in cultured upper motor neurons that the number of uh, mitochondria does not go significantly down in the disease. 
but they indeed become sick in the sense that they lose their inner mitochondrial membranes and they kind of become ghost. So total number do not change, but their cytoarchitecture definitely differs. Got it, got it, okay. Um, anyway, thank you so much for everyone for joining us. Um, I think um, uh, Kate is going to put up a, um, a, a shameless plug for a donation page here in a moment. Uh, there it is. Um, it's alongswim.org and the, um, the donate button is um, uh, again, it's, um, it's pretty obvious on the, on the front page of the, of the website. So uh, join us while we continue to, um, uh, to swim. We're gonna continue to swim until there's a cure. And, um, uh, and, and with, uh, with, with partners like Mukesh and Hande, uh, we know we're on the right path. So thank you everybody for joining us. Um, uh, thank you Mukesh for, um, uh, for your hard work and being really exemplary as the Ellen Fellow. Um, I wish you could have met her, so. Thank you so much. Yeah, before we go, I would really, really like to say thank you to Hande. She's a wonderful, wonderful mentor to me. And to you, Doug, for you know all the swims you do that I can't even imagine doing a fraction of it. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> Brenton and Bennett, both of you, thank you so much for the confidence you have shown into me and our lab. I we really, really thank you for that. This yeah. is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yes, and thank you, Ellen. Also, I think this is time to uh, to remember her as well. And I'm sure that if she was with us, she would be happy. So my goal is also to make her proud. And, and I think Doug and, um, you know, Branton, I think you are making her proud as well. So, um, so thank you, Ellen, as well. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Take good care.